you might not have noticed it or be fully able to put your finger on it. But at some point, Creative Assembly completely changed up a fundamental aspect of how Total War campaigns work. And it's only been for the worse, and I say this absolutely regardless of the games of genre of Total War you love. The year is 2016, the month is May, the date is 24, and I can't be arsed to look up the day of the week. The very first Total War Warhammer sees the light of day, and a new brand of Total War is born, a brand which will spell major consequences for the series. Apart from all the bells, whistles and flashing lights, however, we find ourselves in a Total War game that despite perhaps not having marketed this feature all that much, it's an aspect that's going to have irrevocable consequences for every playthrough from the very first turn. And that aspect is the fundamental issue of starting regions. And before we go on, it would literally make my day if you took just one second to click that subscribe button and also leave a like on the video. I know you thought about doing so for a long time, but I think now is the day. It really helps both me and the channel out, so thank you so very much for becoming a part of it. It's a natural phenomena as they come. No matter what settled faction you're playing as, no matter the game, you're always starting out with something a homeland or a geographical location that belongs to you. Warhammer, of course, have some fierce empires in it. My favorite one of all being the Empire. An empire that ironically, and I say this with absolutely no pretense or sarcasm, is an empire in nothing but name. And that should make you question your own perception of morality and right and wrong. For you see, the Empire of Reichland is supposed to be one of the most powerful entities in this universe, sporting a large army and a grand capital. But on the very first turn, this Empire, in massive and underwhelming quotation marks, sports only one city. One city. And before you mention that they're actually just playing Reichland and that the Empire is actually made up of several factions scattered around it, I'll counter with the argument that this is not a relevant nor valid point because this is a game mechanic on its own. And while it is natural to have some one province city-states in an Empire that tries to depict a fantasy version of the Holy Roman one, the situation in Warhammer is that Reichland, who's supposed to be leading this ragtag bundle of riffraff, is the smallest faction there, despite its imperial neighbors somehow being larger and arguably more powerful at the beginning. The nature of Warhammer lore or power dynamics completely moved aside. The fact that we, as the Empire, as the Bretonians, as the Dwarves, as the Kislevites, or as the quote grand end quote cafe begins with only one province is antithetical to the very nature of Total War and the Empire management. And the reason for this is what I like to call the equality function. The equality function is explained thusly. Regardless of background, regardless of lore, regardless of history, every traditional playable starting faction in Total War Warhammer begins with just one city. Not one province, not a region, but one lonely city. This despite the fact that unplayable factions out in the world often begin with more than just one. And even if this was a lore accurate thing, even if it makes sense in universe, which I certainly don't think it does that all of these factions at the same time all control just one city, it still bothers the hell out of me. The question is, why is this happening? To answer that, let's first go back in Total War history and see what the situation used to be like. Contrary to Warhammer, every Total War game before it took place in historical settings. Rome saw its factions vary greatly, from the Roman factions beginning with 2-3 cities each, to their larger Carthaginian counterparts and the certified massive Seleucid Empire, all on turn 1. In Medieval 2, our empires are generally larger from the get-go, with many beginning with around 5 or more settlements. Although Empire sometimes takes a different approach, cutting down main cities to control larger regions, we still have great diversity in power here, and while France is basically just one city, it controls numerous smaller towns you must manage, in addition to overseas colonies in need of supervision. And there's also the blobbing Austrian and Ottoman empires of course, both of whom start out controlling a number of cities, plus dozens of smaller towns. Shogun 2 might be a bit of an outlier in this regard, with all except for one faction beginning with one city. But Shogun 2 is historically legitimate in doing so, since the factions here aren't really kingdoms at all, but clans, and for good measure, Shogun 2 still offers those smaller towns dotting the landscape. Rome 2 continues the overall trend with sprawling factions in the East and the West, and finally, the crown jewel in the Total War roster for most fucked up and badass starting positions is Total War Attila. 
Look at this gorgeous mess. Right from the start, you have two massive empires smearing themselves all over the world with a few medium-sized ones and then a bunch of one province or even horde factions here and there. Now this disparity in power levels, if you will, might at first look odd. Some empires clearly look more in control than others and from an outside perspective, it might seem from turn 1 that this world's fate is sealed. But if you spend even one minute in Total War Attila, this most asymmetrical of games, you quickly find that size not matters, in fact don't. <laughs> Take a quick glance at the Western Roman Empire, and you see that, yeah you might be coloring half the world in your gorgeous red, but are you really in control? Of course not, you're literally crumbling from inside, losing money here, facing rebellions there, all the while hostile factions are coming for your borders. Conversely, we have tiny Germanic factions built around just one city or even less. You're not as powerful or humongous as the Roman Empire, but that's the point. Your public order is better, your tribe is unified, your army is loyal, and while the Romans have as their first priorities to consolidate and protect what is theirs, you are agile and swift and can attack where it hurts without really fearing much immediate retaliation from them. This is the asymmetric function, the idea that differences between factions, smaller or larger, is part of what creates the fun. I mean, who doesn't want to be the David growing up against a floundering Goliath, and who the heck wouldn't love to be the captain that stared the Titanic, saw the iceberg in the distance, and managed in the nick of time to stay clear of it and sail safely into port at the end of the day? Asymmetry creates dynamism, it creates a sensation of overcoming, and importantly, it makes every campaign feel like this world has been lived in. Because just like in real life or fantasy universes for that matter, no two or ten kingdoms should be absolutely equal in size and conditions at any given date, especially the starting date. And the real reason why Attila's complete devotion to asymmetry works so well? Because hard campaigns are fun, because overcoming challenges are fun. And if you don't want it so difficult, you always have the choice of playing as the smaller tribes that are more in line with regular factions. But Attila offers everything to everyone, from the city-less hordes, the small settled factions, to the massive empires. But perhaps, since Attila is an outlier here in just how asymmetrical it is, let's use another example more people might be familiar with. Let's do Rome in Rome 2, and this is why. Rome is your average sized faction. If there was a standard for faction sizes, Rome's would be at 1, and everything else would be measured in comparison to it. On turn 1, Rome begins with a handful of cities, albeit in only 2 or 3 provinces. But still, Rome isn't considered a particularly tough as nails faction, but by and large as the normal difficulty one, even though of course on higher difficulties you may very well come up against a fair share of challenges. The Etruscans in the north, the Carthaginians in the south and west, and perhaps even Greeks in the east. As Rome, even at this earliest of stages, as a fairly consolidated faction, you have to think about maintaining public order, about where to move your armies so as to deal with the Etruscans as quickly as possible, all the while specializing each of your cities for trade, growth and warfare, and even think ahead because that Carthaginian navy will probably look threatening within your first 10 to 30 turns. This means that even as a relatively small faction, you need to prioritize and think down several avenues at once. Even though the original Rome offers a simplified version of this with its Roman factions, the main idea still applies, namely that fledgling empires usually begin with more than one city because they already hold a certain amount of power and might even be on the move. Indeed, so much fun can inherently be created when we are given multiple cities from the start. Perhaps my favorite example of this is the Greek cities, who by some miracle begins with not only two cities in the Greek heartlands, but one city on the Ionian coast, one city on Rhodes in the east, and a last bloody city on Sicily with Syracuse. The Greek cities begins with five cities, meaning in terms of its size is quite the powerhouse, but when you think of how scattered they are, and that the Greeks kind of lack manpower to fully defend them all and expand at the same time, it's a strategic funhouse bar almost none. And really, it doesn't take that much. Returning to Warhammer now, let's say we wanted to see how this would work. Obviously, we have to adjust for the fact that our province system works differently now. So while Rome offers only dedicated cities, Warhammer offers provinces containing one main city and several small towns. Well, this is what Warhammer could have done. In virtually every settled Warhammer faction campaign intro, we are tasked with defeating an enemy army and conquering nearby towns to complete and consolidate our home province containing our capital. 
What could have happened instead, in the case of the Empire, is to simply provide the good man Karl with the entire Reich clan province, including every town within the province limits. In addition, we could add some public order issues, perhaps a smidge of corruption factors and rebel generals here and there. In short, we now have, from the very first turn, a faction that while consolidated and controls an entire province worth of settlements, cannot only be properly managed, but one that actually has to be defended, and whose actions must be carefully thought through. Perhaps you're even bordering enemy or hostile settlements already, and must deal with the possibility of an incursion, all while the regular empire mechanics, dealing with unruly imperial counts and electors, must be carefully maneuvered. At the same time, in Bretonia, which in the lore is a unified kingdom, should be unified in Warhammer as well. Standing in conceptual opposition to Karl Franz as the ruler of a province within a larger empire, Bretonia could have been a realm that independently controlled several provinces, but one which was forced to deal with an uppity peasantry and disloyal dukes, in addition to bordering or even warring with orc boys and whatever else this universe has to offer of evil non-humans. Again, I'm not first and foremost making a lore argument here, because lore and history vary all the time. I'm talking about that offering factions that represent different points of history, and factions that are not just mechanically dissimilar, but also geographically asymmetrical, or at least different, gives the player an untold number of various ways to approach the game and each campaign. What is so jarring to me about the current system in Warhammer is that basically whoever you begin as, be it the Empire, Bretonia, Kislev or Cathay, four factions which should be controlling empires of different sizes and strengths, all offer the exact same starting conditions. One city, one army, one enemy army to defeat, and one planned enemy settlement to conquer. It's all so incredibly cookie cutter and bland, and I can't even begin to describe how much uniqueness and immersion it removes from the experience when everyone begins on an equal playing field. Because this is essentially how every first turn goes. You begin construction of a building or an upgrade, and maybe even raise a few units in your army. You attack the trial enemy, which is always incredibly easy to defeat, and you go for the nearest enemy city, of which there is at least always one. You begin your research, and might do the usual things, like establishing trade with nearby factions. But in traditional Total War games, the first turn can be so incredibly important, because this is where you at least set up your campaign, and plan for the future. When there are more options, there are more things that can go wrong, but it also creates for a much more dynamic experience that can change with every playthrough. In Warhammer, I do the same moves basically every single campaign. I really don't know when or who thought this was a good direction to take the series in, but for the record, I think it's bad. Because Total War is not like Civilization. It's not a campaign where everybody should begin as equals, and where the race to the top is a matter of simply going from 0 to 100 the quickest. And of course, Warhammer has a few mechanics that differentiate itself from the other Total Wars, namely the fact that internally, each legendary lord has to deal with different restraints and opportunities in the unique faction mechanics. But these do not cancel each other out, and I don't understand why the unique mechanics cannot come on top of a system where factions begin as differently sized empires. This would create not just unique starting positions and challenges related to them, but also added the faction flavor on top. A big problem now arises, because the fact is that Warhammer isn't just Warhammer. Total War games sometimes have spillover effects, and this has never been as true as it is right now and how it's been for the past 7 years. Because if we take a look at the games that came after Warhammer, with the notable exception of the Attila engine based Thrones of Britannia, there are some glaring similarities. And before we get to them, I actually want to give Thrones major props for this one. Thrones, despite overall lacking a charm, a gameplay experience that more blended in with this time period, and a functioning UI that didn't make you want to gouge your eyes out, at least managed to take that historical sense further, and fully feel, no matter how laggy or muddy it might be, like a historical title. Factions actually begin with sometimes a larger number of settlements, like Wessex, and I have to say that some of these mechanics related to buildings manage to make trade and production rather interesting, if not only because they're different. But no matter the other aspects, factions has scale, and that's an interesting thing to note when, after all, this is Britain we're talking about. And when Wessex, a backward kingdom from a backward island, feels like a great power, and even greater power than the Empire in Warhammer, which is supposed to be one of the most powerful entities on the planet, Thrones has continued the legacy of Total War as it should be, and done something right, while at the same time making it so evident that the Warhammer City starting system is rotten. It's no surprise that both Warhammer 2 and Warhammer 3 continue this trend seeing as they're in the same series, but I doubt it would have been impossible to improve it or even completely change it up on a game by game basis. Either way, not only did the system affect all three Warhammer games, but to a certain extent, other IPs. Three Kingdoms has a massive share of factions beginning with just one city, but it must be said that alongside Thrones of Britannia, it's actually done quite well in differentiating its factions in the traditional sense. 
for while so many characters have just one town to manage from the get-go, we also have those with around a handful, and that's not bad at all. Since this is China though, it would have been truly epic to have one or more actually vast empires as starting powers, but this might be an issue that's due more to the time periods offered by Creator Assembly than the actual game design. It is, however, a fact that there are just so many factions beginning with just one settlement, which I think could have been fixed and made a lot more immersive by simply integrating Empire Total War's smaller town system into the game. But then we get to a Total War saga Troy, and this is where things take a much sharper turn. Troy, unlike China and the Warhammer series, but very much like Thrones of Britannia, is a focused type of Total War game, one where Greece and Ionia is front and center. Zoomed down, but not at all lacking in cities and world space, Troy nevertheless falls into the trap of once again offering just one city per settled faction, without even giving, again, smaller settlements or towns to pad out the larger cities. And no, I do not consider the smaller cities in each province as padding the map with villages. The fact that gold-rich and mighty Agamemnon starts with only one city, which is less than virtually every single faction surrounding him, is just weird, and again feels like an artificial way of opening up a campaign. While it is true that Troy also inherits the best from Warhammer 3, namely its unique faction mechanics which are simply truly great, it does sadly gamify this experience that each faction is so similar, and faces the same challenges, when it comes to starting regions and the very first few turns. And whether we are talking Thrones of Britannia, Three Kingdoms or Troy, they've all inherited Warhammer's structure of having your first fight be an easy one against some minor faction. And even though the previous games also to some extent had their version of this, Rome 1 for example had to take Suggesta as a Julii, which is just an iconic rebel city by now, the fact that every faction fights more or less the same tutorial enemy army begins to feel generic and streamlined in a way it didn't used to be. The question then becomes, are there merits to this new system? Does the equality function have objectively or at least arguably positive sides? Well, sure, having every playable faction begin with just one city makes sure that you always have that sense of starting small and expanding, perhaps even against great external odds. A problem in most if not all strategy games is after all that after a certain amount of turns, and if you know how to play the game well and succeed, you kind of start snowballing, meaning you become more and more powerful to the point where it gets boring because no one can reliably oppose you. Having players begin with only one city then can in theory make the stage come much later or not at all. Having just one starting city also gives all the playable factions that equal playing field from the get-go, meaning that to some degree, you're not necessarily playing a much harder faction than the others because you're not suddenly going up against a much larger empire from the start. And this I think ties heavily into the multiplayer aspect of the Warhammer series, and even though it might not have been designed for it from the get-go, especially Warhammer 3 and its 7 player online multiplayer campaigns. When playing with other people, beginning at the same -ish level can be fun, because it creates a race where everyone tries to reach the top first, but they all begin at the bottom. In this way, balance becomes the key word and concept, and if it's a kind of balance Creative Assembly has aimed for here, it does make a certain amount of sense. The only problem, of course, is that empire building isn't balanced, and it isn't fair. Video games can and should of course compensate for this to a certain extent, meaning that it's possible for an underdog to triumph against the overlord, but to really only do so at great cost and effort. With mostly everyone beginning as equals, it doesn't really give that same rewarding feeling of toppling a powerful foreign adversary, even though of course you're bound to meet powerful factions later on in the game. Thing is though, when it comes to snowballing, the Warhammer series and the historical games for that matter have several avenues for restructuring the game during the mid to late campaign, in the form of endgame challenges. Warhammer has the most out of any Total War game actually, even allowing us to select that several such challenges are possible to meet in a campaign. So if snowballing is a factor, one doesn't necessarily need to rely on one city starting factions as long as you make the game inherently challenging enough throughout. For the multiplayer aspect, while the Warhammer system theoretically increases balancing, it might just do the opposite, while also creating an unrealistic universe. Balance comes first and foremost from the skills of the people playing, not the faction starting positions, and I wholeheartedly mean that. In other words, you could have a player take the reins of Attila's Western Roman Empire, while another play as the Huns. In theory, this sounds unbalanced since the Roman player will have a massive challenge keeping their empire going, especially when coming up against a human player. But in a situation where the Roman player is actually more experienced, the skill of the player balances out the situation, and the asymmetrical starting locations and factions will in the end make for a more dynamic and exciting campaign with a ton of twists and turns. Indeed, this dynamism and realistic sense of large empires and smaller principalities and tribes was one of the reasons why I fell in love with Total War in the first place, and part of the reason why I still to this day find games like Civilization so dry and uninspiring. Civilization has to of course begin with a settler that can produce exactly one city, and this goes for every player and AI faction. 
at the end of the day, civilization is in fact all about the race from the bottom to the top, with every player, not counting for skill or random luck related to the starting geography, begins at the same level, namely with nothing. It was perhaps in the end civilization's non-historical features, and in my proud opinion, those awful hexagon tile maps that really put that series off for me, even though I recognize it has its own charms and qualities. But as you can tell, having such one city factions becoming the norm is kind of a bummer to me, because I value that realistic asymmetrical world state, even in fantasy universes, who also should obey the same rules. I've talked about how this can make sense for balancing and for multiplayer purposes, but both of these reasons are not actually inherently good reasons to do anything. They're just aspects that might justify such a leap because they create a larger sense of balance. In this way then, changing up how large factions are from the start seems like a game design and system choice, or even a sacrifice, more than anything related to fun or a sense of immersion. And this goes to the heart of other criticism I have of the later Total War games as well, namely that everything is done to appease a certain system, or even a fault in it. The fact that we have army and agent limits for example is not something that makes sense from an immersion perspective, but from a gameplay standardization, streamlining, and balance perspective, the merits might be starting to show. It's more of a band-aid than anything, because what these systems are ultimately meant to do is prevent army and agent spam. In the same way, Total War games had to implement city garrisons because the AI were so bad at actually defending their cities, meaning that garrisons could actually prevent you from taking a city without much of a fight. The one city rule then makes sense when it's seen from the perspective of fixing a flaw in the game that the developer perhaps can't fix by other means, namely either a sense of balance or that factions won't disappear in their very first turns because they actually managed to take care of their one or top two cities. But it certainly doesn't make for a more fun or immersive experience. When it comes down to it though, I simply can't fathom why we're finding ourselves in the current situation, because it's not like Total War's historical starting locations were complicated to control, or that most factions needed a ton of micromanaging from the start due to an overbearing imperial system. In fact, almost no Total War game demands that you spend a lot of time preparing on your very first turn, unless of course you go out of your way to play as the likes of the Seleucid Empire in Rome, or the Roman Empire's in Barbarian Invasion, or Attila. And even when you did choose to do so, because well, these empires are awesome to try and tackle, it made the adventure so much more fun, because you actually felt like you had to think differently from the very beginning, and not just get your bearings, but assume control of the most disgustingly huge and decadent hegemons out there. This is why Total War became Total War, the fact that the campaigns have depth and felt realistic and dynamic. I really don't know what Creative Assembly will think of next, or if they have toyed with the idea of finally scrapping the province system which they've made use of since 2013, but I truly can't wait for this session of Total War history to be over. If we look at another strategy series, like let's say Crusader Kings or Europa Universalis, there is a reason why every nation on Earth are differently sized. First of all, and not surprisingly, it's historical, so it kind of has to be, but second, because it makes for much better gameplay when we diversify in faction size and power. What is interesting is that there are mods that shattered the world, so to speak, meaning every single county or region belongs to a single faction. And even though I admire the madness, that's not really my cup of tea. It is fun to have that option in CK3 or EU4 of course, and in the same vein, it would have been great to see factions in games like Warhammer begin with more than just one. As should be clear by now, I value at least a sense of realism and dynamism in favor of force balancing and an artificially leveled playing field. Frankly, the historical versus fantasy trope is boring and was never actually a good way to view the series in the first place. Because fantasy can be and is awesome, it just has to be done right. And if the Warhammer series had gone in the opposite direction, enhanced the sense of empire management depth, and actually portrayed this vast and fantastical kingdoms and empires and everything in between, as weird and as glorious as they are supposed to be, I think the initial impression for many a Total War player would have been completely different. There is after all a reason why so many historical Paradox players also love Stellaris. Sure, it does take place in the future, but for all intents and purposes, it is a sci-fi fantasy game with alien races and the whole spiel. But you know what? It works for Stellaris, because Stellaris is freaking awesome, offers an insane amount of complexity, and doesn't shy away from giving the player a real challenge. But what do you think? Is the city system in the later Total War games, and Warhammer in particular, a waste of potential? Do you prefer varied, dynamic, and asymmetrical kingdom and empire design from the get-go, or is it best to balance the experience with the ones city factions on a level playing field. And what about the city and province design in particular? Does it ruin any chance of creating meaningful, powerful city-states, or does it not matter? Let me know your thoughts on these questions and this video in the comments, and remember to leave a like, a comment, and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers!